Hello and welcome to Hey Not The Face with your host John Nash and your producer me Steffi Haynes and today we are going to continue talking about the UFC contract all the ins and outs for it but first before we do that John needs to make a correction and a small item from our last episode so John how the hell are you and what's the correction I was so shocked because you don't make mistakes uh, well, I make I make a lot of mistakes, but I, I'm going to blame the fact that I just got over COVID. My mind was not clear, and uh, I, I screwed some stuff up. But uh, other than that, I'm I'm uh, I'm doing fine, doing good, except for the the shame of being wrong about something. Oh no! So what were you wrong about? Well, there's there's two things. One, I wasn't wrong. I, I don't think I was clear enough, and that's about the video game rights. Uh, I made it sound, I think, like you have three years that the video game rights retain. The three years is the UFC has three years to use you in a video game, and that otherwise the rights go back to you. But all the rights for the merchandise, all that stuff, is two years after the contract ends. They have an additional two years after the contract ends that they have the rights to you. And what I got wrong, the other one was actually much bigger. And and this is it's amazing that I, I got this so badly wrong. And part of it, I, I based it on a different contract, and I just my mind never got around to the to adjusting to the the standard contract. But I had said that the contract start when on the uh, commence on the day of your first fight. That is not accurate. They commence on the day you sign the contract, and so it's not a ma- it, It's not that big a deal because you're talking about weeks or months of additional time in the contract. But it's big when you're talking about like Francis and Ganu because technically he's probably a free agent right now. That means. Because he signed his contract, and by all accounts, in early December 2017. So five years later, with that sunset provision, he'd be a free agent. On the if he if he, if it started on the commencement date, his five year sunset would be in, in January. So not a lot of time, not big difference, probably not you know not a major mistake. But on the ends, on the nuts and bolts, we're talking about when we have these items like Francis and Gano and other fighters their sunset clause. It's it's important to get that right, that detail right. And I was wrong. So that's the correction. It starts on the day you sign the contract. All right. Okay. So we're going to pick up where we left off. And we're looking now at section five. Yeah, section five, page 38. For those following along in the material, we linked for you. So section five reads thusly. For each bout, fighters shall execute and comply with the terms of about agreement and then it has about agreement in quotations and one or more ap- applicable regulatory agreements e.g. athletic commission agreement nevada rules agreement etc to the extent of any conflict between this agreement and about agreement with respect to about the about agreement shall control i have one question sir before you start breaking it down go ahead in this little paragraph it states one or more applicable regulatory agreements there are athletic commission agreements and nevada rules agreements it's two separate things i'm just asking for clarification well, yeah yeah the the certain athletic commissions will give you a piece of paper to sign saying this that you understand what the rules are you understand their drug testing policies you understand okay. the rules the uh, unified rules all the regulations there they even have their own some of them have their own templates for bout agreements that have to be filled out okay so the ufc will give you a bout agreement for them but then they'll also you have to sign the the commission bout agreement so the, it depends on the it's different, you know, state to state, commission to commission, but those are the additional agreements that sometimes you might have to sign. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to you and let you break down about agreement point by point. Well, so what page do we go to to find the actual about agreement? Well, there's several about agreements in this, this the, the doc we gave it, but we're going to go to the, the, on page 61, it's called the Zufa LLC Bout Agreement for UFC Fight Night, July 15, 2020. All the bout agreements are almost basically identical. So, but this will be the one we'll use. So if everybody wants to scan ahead to that, you will see the bout agreement, just a simple kind of contract, only six pages that details, uh, it actually repeats some of the information in the normal agreement. And upon it, it says that the you know it, it says that it has a thing about asking if the fighter wishes to engage and is willing and fully able to participate in a mixed martial arts bout because fighters are independent contractors. It, it's combat sports, uh, single 
single combat, mano mano, mano mano, you have to agree to take part in that. You have to verbally and, and not only verbally sign a document saying you're willing to take part in that, otherwise it's assault. So we need to get that signed in this contract. And then you go down and there's all these other, but you get down to the important thing, it's the bout terms. And this is what it is. The bout terms is you need to ju- you need to spell out what's gonna ha- what that fight is. It has to say who the fighter is. The fighter in this case is uh, t- uh, uh, Santos, who we got the whose contracts we're using. It has to state who the opponent's gonna be for the bout agreement. You can't leave that blank. A bout agreement has to have an opponent. Has to have a date it's gonna take place. It has to have a location it's gonna take place. It has to have the weight division, the, the agreed upon weight that they're gonna fight at the number of rounds that they're going to fight for, and what the fighter is going to be paid for that event. I have a question, sir, before you move on. Go ahead. Going back to the opponent, we often see things that say uh, fighter name versus to be determined or to be announced. How does that fit in here, if at all? Well, that, that the, the fighter might have verbally agreed that they're going to do something, or the UFC might say that they're going to do this fight, but we don't have a bout agreement yet. It ha- we don't have an okay. official signed bout agreement because there's no opponent. You need an opponent okay. to Just get the bout agreement. Sure, that's all. Sure. And then, so if you continue the next step of the bout agreement, it, it talks about the promotional responsibilities. Now, we, we brought this up briefly in the contract. It says fighters have to do certain promotional responsibilities. All this, too, is also laid on in the outfitter guideline, the, the policy guideline the, uh, for the fighters. That's an addendum to the contract. And it lays out all the stuff you have to do. Fighters are responsible for a certain amount of promotion. And this it lays out kind of like what you're required to do. You have to, and for public relations, you have to have advanced media time frame. And uh, it tells you, confirming when you'll start the fight week. You, shall, you have to be available for, you have to participate in five media days, Right. Uh, and then it keeps going down all the other step. Three days of promotion, uh, fight week media you have to do, post-fight media you have to do, TV video programming production, long-form promotional programming, digital programming, fight week event broadcasting, a photo shoot, all that stuff you're responsible to help participate in in promoting the event. So they have a long list of stuff you have to do, and if you don't do that, you do not get your outfit, your... uh, your Venom kit now payments. It's tied to that. Wow. On on top of this, this is this is one that people are. I don't think a lot of people are aware of. You also have to do event marketing. You have what's called pay per view partner marketing, where you have to read a bunch of promotional stuff they use for commercials. But then there's a merchandise consumer products. Fighters shall autograph Zufa provided mer- merchandise up to 25 items to be used as promotional tools. And fighters shall autograph no less than 130 event posters when they arrive and check in at the, ho- the host hotel. Each athlete shall receive one autographed poster and two unsigned posters per event. Now, the, all that stuff you have to resign. It's part of your agreement. It's in the spout agreement. It's it's in the it's me- it's it's referenced in the promotional agreement. It's in your guidelines agreement. So you have to do this. What people aren't aware is those items are then auctioned off often by the UFC or sold. Because they fall under promotional events, right? Uh, because they they fall under that that category, promotional events, uh, you do not get any revenue. You don't get a, a cut of that. It's not part of the merchandise royalty agreement. Wow. So they're out here signing 130 posters, no less than 130 posters, but they only get to keep three yeah, they get to keep three, one signed, two one signed, and on top, then they can do what they want. It's for their collection. But the rest, the UFC auctions that stuff off, sells it, and because it falls into event uh, merchandise or promotional merchandise, either category, the fighters do not get a cut of that. That's not part of the deal where they get a royalty from it. And I'm assuming that the autograph poster that you get to keep that they're referring to is the one that all the fighters sign, and so they give one of those to the fighter, correct? I doubt they're yeah. giving them, oh, here's your own autograph poster that you get to keep, and here's two more that are not signed. Yeah, I, I, you know what? I've never asked specifically about that, but, I, but assume, I imagine you're right. Yeah, okay. I just wanted to uh, touch on that in case you did know. I was just making that broad assumption. Mm-hmm. Please continue, sir. 
Well, that's basically that's the gist of the bout agreement. There's some other items, but it's a lot of it's covered in the promotional agreement. But that's the gist. It tells you when you're going to fight. It's going to tell you how much promotion you recovered, and it also tells you the the additional signatures you're responsible for. Which every fighter is. Re, every, that's why every fighter's you know hands are probably tired after that first day because they're signing. And we've seen shots of them signing endless amount of posters mm -hmm. or or other merchandise that is auctioned off. And so that's and, and the UFC makes millions on that per year on those items, right. millions. So it's a, it's a very lucrative business for them, which again the fighters get not nothing from. And in addition to that, nothing they also get nothing from the Crypto.com deal. They get nothing well, from the Under Armour shoes. <laughs> again, the sponsorship deals covered in the the, the agreement. Yeah. You have no right. The UFC has the has the right to all sponsorship in the cage. You have no right to wear any logos, anything in the cage. And so really the UFC is going above and beyond in their in their book by giving you any payment to wear the the Venom kit because technically they could make you wear that and not pay you anything. So we're going to move into section six. Now I'm going to read section 6.1 and then turn it over to John to take you through the points. Subject in all events to section 10.1, the compensation to fighter shall take the form of a fighter's purse. And if only, if and only if fighter is declared the winner of a bout by the athletic commission, a win bonus and the other bonuses and other amounts as set forth below. So obviously we are in the compensation section of the contract. So John, I'm going to let you take us through point by point. Yeah, so this is 6.1 starting. It's in page 38. So we got to go back to where we were, 38, for those following along on their on their documents. Uh, really, this just spells out the, the compensation. What's interesting is the it's it's the win bonus. It's not a show, it's not a win payment, it's a win bonus. It's a bonus. So, and part of that's because some state regulation, reg, uh, some states have regulations on what has to be paid. Everything has to be paid fully on the night of the event, except for bonuses. So, if you call it a win bonus, it's an additional payment later. You do not have, not only do you not have to guarantee that payment, that because it only comes if you win, you don't have to pay it immediately. So that's that. If you go continue on, you'll see the basic UFC contract, and this one it's ten thousand. To, to guarantee your fighter purse plus 10,000 you win as the bonus. And then every time they win, it gets bumped up. So this is the common escalation on the contracts. So this case, it's 2,000, 12,000. If you win your first fight, if you win two fights, it's up to 14,000, et cetera, et cetera. Eventually, you know, this fighter will probably sign a 20,000 and 20,000 contract. And then if you win, it's $3,000 bonus. They have a tier system. It keeps going up. Uh, if, but if you continue on, if you go down to 6.2, right, uh, Zufa shall pay fighters' purse and any applicable, applicable win bonus to fighters within 72 hours of completion of each bout, except for the tighter if the fighter tests positive for any controlled substance. Okay, so fighters do not technically have to be paid the night of the fight, right? They they have up the contract says you have up to 72 hours. Now some state athletic commissions demand that you have whatever's set aside gets paid to that fighter that night. Give him a check or whatever, right? So I think Nevada has that. So that has to be paid. But this 72 hours is slightly different. The older contracts had 48 hours. And my only assumption I can have is because they do so many international events, they wanted an extra day for the wire transfers. Huh. Because, because they're doing so many wire transfers. they got to give themselves some time to make sure they can make these payments. Smart. And so that's, I just, it's something small that's different in the older one. I thought I'd note it. So fighters, sometimes, you know, you win for that 72 hour period, you, you get your, you get your payment. Now you might get, you just your, your base payment and your purse, you know, might come later. So if you get paid that night at the commission calls it, it can come up to 72 hours later, you can get your win bonus. And this doesn't cover obviously the side letters and pay-per-view bonuses, which are dip, they're different agreements are often much later, but we'll, you know, we'll talk at that some other time. I don't, unfortunately cannot put a side letter up here right now. So uh, if we continue on, on compensation, we now get down to 6.6 .6, merchandise and licensed video game compensation. Mm -hmm. In the past, this was a separate addendum that the fighters would sign. Okay. Now they incorporate directly into the contract. So it's part of the contract. And if you look at the next one, the merchandise royalty, shall be equal to 15% of gross revenue, and then they define it, 
or 30% of net revenue as, as defined, okay? And then in, in other merchants of the case may be received by Zupa uh, in connection with any uh, commercial exploitation of a license, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So gross revenue means all revenue other than taxes, credit card fees, shipping, and handling received by Zupa in connection with the commercial exploitation of merchandise uh, that Zupa itself or through a design manufacturer distributor to consumers Less returns and allowances, man, that's just, that's complicated, I guess. And then the net revenue means the net amount of revenue actually received by Zupa minus any costs, expenses, and credit. So anyways, the gross is is basically the, the payment when they get royalties, but the, the expenses haven't been deducted yet. The net is when, let's say, a third party gets the, gets the revenue, they deduct their costs and then give it to Zupa. So you get a bigger share of the net because it's most expenses have already been taken out. All right, I'm looking at 6.6.2 for any merchandise that uses both fighter's identity and the name and or likeness of others with respect to whom Zufa has entered into a merchandising or other licensing agreement, e.g. other UFC fighters, the merchandise royalty shall be divided by the number of such fighters featured in such merchandise. Please explain this to me. Well, if, if you have, a let's say, a, 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 a playing card, right? The, there's a playing card or some other item like that, and it's sold, and there's several fighters on that playing card. Maybe it's a it's a fight. Maybe it's, you know, it's a playing card that uh, talks about Frank Trigg versus Matt Hughes, right? It's a, about that particular rivalry. Well, the royalties are sold. The individual fighter does no longer gets 30% of the net or 15% of the growth. gross. The two of them have to split that, that royalty. So each one would get, let's say, if it's a if it's a uh, gross, each one would get seven and a half percent of the gross. Six point six three. This is what I was talking about earlier about uh, some of the events are not covered. So no merchandise royalty shall be earned or paid with respect to event merchandise or for merchandise used in promotional marketing or goodwill purposes. So that covers, like I said, the stuff that's sold at the event. Uh, that you don't get in royalties and that it's the stuff that you sign that's that's part considered part of the promotional or event merchandise so all that stuff which is a huge chunk of a lot of the merchandise they make a lot of they do a lot of merchandise sales at those events and and also they auction off those signatures that's so none of that's covered fighters do not get a cut of that and can, the next one 6.64 in consideration for the rights granted and to use fighters identity in connection with the licensed video game uh, fighter, fighters should be eligible for discretionary bonuses to be paid by Zufo from time to time, provided that if, if a fighter's identity appears in a licensed video game. Fighters shall be guaranteed at least one such bonus. So it's a discretionary bonus. It's up to the UFC the amount they want to pay or if they want to pay you, except for the fact that if you're in the video game at least once, if you're in it the first time, let's say, you get your guaranteed some payment. doesn't say how much. Again, it's discretionary, their choice. But you get at least one. But that doesn't mean if you're in future versions of the game, continue. You get another bonus. You get another payment. So, wow. that's... so when when the EA uh, releases the yearly UFC game, if you've already received one and they're putting you in a brand new version of the game, it's up to them if they decide to gift you with another one. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, the one big benefit is you know you're going to get something, and the UFC does have a system very similar to like the how the uh, out, the uniform payments go, where fighters do get paid to be in with the video game. But remember, talking to people when the video game first appeared, there was a lot of fighters that got nothing yes. from the first video game. So yeah. you, you're getting something, but it's still it's not a lot of money. There's it's not like you get royalties from it. You're, you're getting nothing. You're getting a one time payment based on the UFC. And we know that the UFC is getting millions and millions from the game. So it's uh, it's definitely in their favor. And that the, the very key term here is royalties, because a lot of people, a lot of fans out there assume that these fighters are getting, quote, royalties off these video games. So it's important to note that that's not actually a real term, at least in this construct that we're talking about right here. Correct? Yeah, exactly. Also, it's it's how is the the contract negotiated with the UFC? Because uh, if you look at like uh, Sean O'Malley was complaining about his yes. outfitter kit, the Reebok kit, what his royalties were. Well, there. We don't know how the UFC structured the contract because with the UFC gets a percentage, and you know I have some stuff that I've seen when the, that's floating around. That I know some of the some of the years what their what their payments were. But let's say the UFC got twelve percent royalties 
from a, a merchandise product that was sold, right? Mm -hmm. So they get 12%. Well, then from that 12% that the UFC gets, Sean O'Malley gets 15%, mm -hmm. right? So now you're down to 1.8% uh, of the original amount. <laughs> Good Lord. So, uh, sorry, not 1.8, 2.25%, my mistake. So 2.25%. So not a large amount that he's getting from the original sale. On top of that, we don't know. It's for, they get a cut of the royalties. What happens if the UFC does a system where they get a large lump sum signing bonus or whatever from the, 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 uh, the, the company that wants to, you know, print their merchandise or sell their items or whatever, you know, with their logo on it. What if they say, we're going to give you 10 million up front and then we're going to give you 10 to 15%. The fighters don't get a stake in that, that, that cash payment. They only get it from the royalties. Okay. Six, section 6.8 payments, all merchandise royalty payments due and owing to fighter hereunder shall be made annually on or before March 1st for the immediately preceding calendar year. Tell me about that. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's your, that's all your payments get paid at one time uh, about March 1st. It has to come before. So if one time a year, they're, they're, they're going through the books, they're getting all the amounts, and then they send you a check for what your royalties are. Okay, which are probably very small. But for most, I mean, there are some fighters probably making something, but again, they're making a small percentage compared to what the UFC is. The, if you go to the next one, this is kind of interesting, six nine, because it's not on the older the when the when the merchandise agreement is a separate addendum. I did not see this on there. So the books and records at six point nine during the terms of the agreement for one year following the termination or expiration of the agreement, fighters should have the right at a fighter's sole cost and expense upon thirty days prior written notice to Zufa to authorize a reputable license and certified public accounting firm approved by Zufa to audit and review. So fighters, you have if you, you have to find a, a reputable pu public accounting service, well, I don't know what, what qualifies one for that. Zufa has to agree to that, that firm and you give them a 30-day notice. You are one uh, during the terms of the agreement and for one year following the, the expiration date, I guess one time you can do this, you can come in and audit the books uh, uh, to see if the royalty payments are accurate. Wow. I, I, I've never heard of anyone taking them up on this, to tell you the truth. But why would they add this in? You said this is new. Well, my guess is because the previous contract, they viewed it when maybe when Endeavor came and looked at it and said, that is way too one-sided. You can't have an agreement where you can't, the fighters cannot see what the, how we came to them, how we came to the determination of what they got paid. Okay. We have to give them some right to look at the, the 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 accounting that we use to pay them and so i think that's why they put it in because otherwise it was too onerous too one-sided agreement and so there are certain things they've done i'm not sure this a lot of the other stuff is obviously from the antitrust lawsuit i'm not 100 certain this from the antitrust lawsuit and more so man that's just too we went too far before we got it we got to tilt the other way a little bit okay now we're going to get into section seven incidentals tell us about incidentals john this is all the stuff they give you for the fight week that is not part of your basic payment. And this you'll see, uh, again, you're on page, I believe we're on page 41 now. If you just go down the list, 7.1 is about your purse, but 771A is for each champ non-champion bout, fighters participate, shall be provided two hotel, hotel or motel rooms and two round-trip economy class tickets for the fighter, and a coach. So you get two. If you want to bring more, you got to pay for it yourself, which a lot of fighters end up doing. For championship bouts, you get another ticket. You get three. You get two hotel rooms and three round trips. So people, two people have to share a room, right? Uh, if you keep going down, there's on for each day, you get a per diem of $60. This per diem hasn't changed for, I think, a decade or so. So it's the same amount. Uh, again, you get for everybody that comes, the one fighter and his trainer, or under your championship bout, the one fighter and his two affiliates, each get sixty dollars a day, which is supposed to cover three million meals and beverages per day. Or, or this is the part that got me, John. This part right here really stood out to me. Not the fact that the sixty dollars hasn't changed, despite that inflation is through the roof, and you can barely eat three meals on sixty dollars, especially in Vegas. But this part got me. Or three meals a day at Zufa's discretion, meal vouchers. Are you oh, yeah. kidding me? 
Well, if they're at a hotel that they have a deal with them, it's probably a good deal that we'll give you the vouchers because we, you know, we we, we can make this food really cheap. Make sure but you go here to is eat. That, so. Is that cheap food, though, conducive to their weight cut and all of that shit? That's what gets me about this. Why not jack up the per diem so that they can continue to eat the food they've been eating through their training camp? Uh, I'm I not know, the first I'm just really You know what? Weird. Sloppy Joe's is fine meals for a fighter to know how late, so. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just, this is stuff that stands out to me that if I'm a fighter, I'm like, why can't I? Why do I have to eat at a hotel that isn't preparing my meals the way that I've been eating them for through training for my weight cut? Why can't you just jump up the per diem sum so that I can actually eat the way I've been eating through training and perform to my best ability? Uh, that is not a priority here. The priority is I uh, keeping the keeping the per diem. Say, I'm just amazed it's still sixty dollars. I am when, too. I, and that it was it's sixty dollars. I believe it was, I, I know it's sixty dollars at least since 2015. And I believe it was sixty dollars back in 2013 and 12 contracts. I'll have to double check, but it's been sixty dollars for like a decade. So a long time of no, just like the fighter bonuses, fighter the night bonuses thing. You know, inflation does not exist in the world of the fight business. Clearly. So, and then last, if you go down to uh, the last ones, uh, F, section F of this on page 42, uh, fighters shall be provided four tickets to each bout. So if you're on a card, they'll give you four tickets. Doesn't say where, but if you're in the main event, your tickets will be located within the first 10 rows of the octagon. So if you're in the main event, you're, you'll get four pretty decent tickets for families and friends. If not, you could be, I, I, we heard stories of fighters finding out that their friends and family are way in the back row. So oh, that's not, terrible. Well, you know, they got they they're they're the, those people aren't paying. They they want people going to pay for the big the, the top seats. Wow. Good lord. All right, let's take a look at section 8 and this might be my favorite part. Fighters conduct. Is this the conduct policy? Yeah, basically, it's 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 repeated the guidelines, but this is basically laid out uh, the the policy of what your fighter's conduct supposed to be. Uh, it's again, it's it's it, it also if you notice, it sets forth. It talks about the UFC conduct policy, uh, which is an additional agreement. Exhibit A calls it as attached to the agreement. So that's that a. Uh, that's that additional uh, contract or addendum added to this. It's not part of the contract, but it covers a lot of the stuff where you're supposed to conduct, how, you, how you're supposed to behave, which they I'm not sure they enforce it or not. I don't know. I, I remember being enforced in the past with Miguel Torres and, and Nate Diaz, but and I'm not Matt so Mitrione. certain. It's, Let's not forget Matt Mitrione. Matt Mitrione, but I'm not sure it's uh, it's a high priority anymore. So at some point, we may actually go through the points of the conduct policy, but for now, we're going to stick to this. So our next section, take us to eight section 8.7. That would okay. be on page 43 for those following along. Well, this is part of the, the conduct policy, but this is the one that addresses that for the... Uh, uh, during the terms and match period, fighters agree to comply with and be bound by all aspects of the UFC ADP, anti-drugging uh, anti-drug policy. The deal, the UFC ADP is the USADA, but also talks about to have samples analyzed at the World Anti-Doping Agency, accredited approved labs. So this is the part when you sign this saying, I am signing on also to the USADA policy. Okay. Section nine. Injury and retirement. Take us through this because I feel like this is an important section right here. Well, we mentioned earlier under the terms that they can, if you're, if you have a disability or you retire, they can, they can freeze your contract for five years, right? Mm -hmm. But this gets through some of the other parts of it. Uh, 9.1, if at any time during the term, Zufa offers to promote a bout for fighter and fighter refuses to participate in or attempts to cancel or postpone such bout. For reasons of a claimed injury or other medical disability, Zufa should have the right but not the obligation of the fighter examined by a medical doctor of its choice at Zufa's expense. And if Zufa so elects, fighters shall appear uh, for such examination on one day's notice. So you got, if, they, if you claim you're injured and you can't take a fight, they can say, we need to get you examined. And if, you, and if they say that, you have one day, the examination will happen in one day. So uh, on top of that, 9.2, if any time during the term, fighter claims to be injured, temporary disabled, 
Zupa made a selection for each such injury or disability claim the fighter, in addition to its right to extend the term set forth in 402, declare that Zupa has satisfied its obligation to promote one of the bouts. So what this means is they can either extend your contract or say, listen, you're injured, you can't take this fight, That's, that counts as a fight. You Now, we're, instead of owing you five fights, we only owe you four fights. Wow. Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> it's still one-sided, John. Whoever was yeah. over there that said this is just too much. It's too onerous. We got to give them something. It's still yeah. one. It's still very. It's very, very, it's very one-sided. <laughs> and then, okay, number nine point three. If at any time during the term, fighter decides to retire from MMA or other professional fighting competition, or is permanently disabled, then Zupo may at its election and in addition to the right to suspend the term, we saw four point four satisfied its obligation to promote all future votes uh, bouts be promoted by Zupo after without any compensation to the fighter thereafter. So in other words, unlike just saying you don't you're gonna lose a fight, we're not done. If they say you retired or have permanent disability, we have the right to say, you know what, the contract's done. We we've agreed we've honored all of our agreements. We've given you we've done everything we can. This the the contract's over. So again it's it's always it's very much, you know, not a hundred percent, but most of the time it's in their favor. And again, that's in their favor because they have the choice. Do we want to keep you under contract and suspend the contract and freeze it while you retire? Or we want to say, you know what? We don't really care. You're done. Section 10. Termination. Remedies. Oof. This this section is basically what this, this whole section is dedicated to the idea that Zupa has, the, okay, they have to give you these fights, right? But also, if there's certain things you do, they can, they can, they're not, they can, they can terminate the contract or withdraw you from, you know, take away your championship title status or both if any of these things are violated by the fighter. Yeah, you notice none of them are, there's nothing that says that the UFC has violated anything. It's always with the fighter is violated. So if the fighter, any fighter's affiliates materially breach, violate, or any or in default of any provision of this agreement or any other agreement hereafter, okay, that's one. B, any of the representation or warnings of fighter container were false. So if you make a false statement, again, well, I guess, you know, we've had recent false statements about injuries. Uh, if you put a false statement into a, one the fighter about agreement or into the contract, you could be terminated for that. Fighters are, are is not declared the winner of any mixed martial arts part. We know that fighters can be cut if they don't win their fight. The UFC has the right to cut you from a contract on a, after any loss. Fighters license to participate in bouts is suspended or revoked by the athletic commission. If the athletic commission revokes your license or suspends you, the UFC has the right to cut you. Fighters unable to obtain necessary documentation. They can cut you if you can't get the proper documentation to fight. Fighters charged with a misdemeanor other than a minor traffic offense or a felony. You get charged with a crime, not convicted, charged other than a minor traffic offense. They have the right to cut you. Fighters should commit any act which would permit any arena, event site, or television broadcaster or distributor exhibitor to cancel its contract with Zupa. Well, okay, that's you've got to have gone pretty far to do that, so maybe I could see why they would cut you. But again, the UFC has the right to cut you. It's the the fight. It's all based on what the fighter does. And another one is fighters injured, disabled, retired, and Zupa exercises its right under Section Nine, which we just talked about. You're injured, you can't fight. The UFC can terminate you. Uh, termination is determined to be an appropriate result by Zufa under its athletic conduct policy. You do bad behavior, something that embarrasses, that breaks the conduct policy. They can terminate you. Zufa discontinues or dissolves the weight class or division that the fighter participates in. If you are in a weight class or division, oh, same thing synonymously most time in MMA, but if you are, let's say, women's flyweight, and they get uh, they get rid of that division. Guess what? They can cut you. They don't that that contract no longer void because they do not no longer have that division. All right, let's get to section ten point five. If fighter believes in good faith that Zufa has materially breached any material provision of this agreement or has unreasonably failed or refused to perform its obligations hereunder. Fighters shall provide Zufa with written notice of such alleged breach and shall provide Zufa with at least 10 business days to cure such alleged breach. Tell me about this, please. Well, this is basically the only fighter's protection. If they get cut, they can claim that the Zufa improperly breached the contract, that what they did did not violate the terms, and that the Zufa has to address the alleged breach. Um, but they have, you know, 10 days. But also, if you look at this, we, you know, we talked about earlier, 
that uh, there's no such thing as the, the UFC doesn't really offer three fights per year. You know, we always say that the UFC has to, they always say we have to offer three fights a year. If we don't, we got to pay them. And we saw earlier in the terms, it's four fights for 20 months, five fights for 20 months. You know, if you divide it, it's basically close to three fights per year, but it doesn't say that they give you those fights. And here's kind of the, the, the point where, the, where the UFC says they have to pay you if they don't give you the fights, that's not true. But if the UFC doesn't give you the fights, let's say the UFC, you fight once for the UFC, you have four fights left, and then they make you sit out the next 20 months, right? Well, at the end of 20 months, your contract's now terminated. You go, listen, you failed to give me the remaining four fights on my contract. You, you breached the agreement. There's nothing I did wrong. Well, then UFC, if they did breach it and they, you know, they will look at it, we'll see if they, they did breach it. The UFC's remedy then would be what we are going to pay you your compensation for the four fights we didn't give you. But that compensation is only going to be your, your, your regular payment. It does include the win bonus. There's no win, so you don't get the bonus. It does include pay-per-view. It does include any other side stuff like that. All includes is your four, your basic payment. So they could technically, like I said, they could give you a fight, make you sit for 20 months, and then, okay, we they didn't give me the fights, so they do have to pay me, but all they have to pay me is at the end of the agreement, after it's terminated, they have to pay me just my regular payments. John, I have a question for you. Could you what? tell us a little bit about the circumstances around Leslie Smith's release? Because that was very curious. Well, basically, it's this contract. Uh, the they they had a fight. She she negotiated. She refused to take the bout. They claimed at that point because they have the right to basically say, uh, you know, we we're, we're going to pay you your 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 fight. We're going to say the contract has been settled and then cut her. That was the last fight of the agreement. They also gave her, I think, a win bonus in that just to you know to smooth it over so it didn't look as bad. But what was the question of that fight that, of course, everybody talks about is Leslie Smith was very vocal about Project Spearhead trying to organize fighters to sign authorization cards. And so I think it's the, the assumption, and I think it's a fair assumption, is they just saw her as a headache and they wanted to get rid of her. But because they have all these means to terminate a contract, that they were given the opportunity when her opponent missed weight and the bout, and she didn't take the bout and it was canceled, that's... That's considered, they can consider that, you know, uh, they, they can't, they, they can consider that a, a, a reason for for terminating the contract, as long as they pay you your, your payment, your your, uh, your regular payment. What's interesting is that she was cut that fight, because usually what would happen for the UFC is like, okay, the fight's not going to go ahead, you're still under contract, we'll book you later. The UFC, there is no future booking, we are done with you, here's the, the here's what we need to pay you to, to redress the breach of the contract, and now we're done. So we're going to move into section 12, the right to match. Please break down 12.1 to start. Well, what's interesting is you notice there is no no exclusive negotiating period anymore. Before, there was a 90-day exclusive negotiating period. Even before that, there was a six-week. But now the, the exclusive negotiating period is complete is gone completely. The, Nate Diaz has it because he has a 2016 contract. He had to wait 90 days after his last win, but fighters now the fight the fight ends. There's no exclusive negotiating period. But what there still is is the same right to match. Even if the sunset provision terminates a contract, that only affects the provisions in the terms for the UFC still has 12 months to match any offer that's been offered to you. If you're offered a, a contract and you decide I'm going to sign that contract, you have to present that to Zufa, right? And Zufa then has the option, the UFC has the option of saying, we are going to match it or not. And if they match it, you have to come back to the UFC. There's no there's no going back after that. You can't go back to the other promoter and say, hey, can you up the offer? No. Whatever you're offered is the last, what, whatever you agree with that original promoter, that other promoter, and say, this is, I'm willing to take this offer. You have to present the UFC. It, it then it's either does the UFC accept it or not. And if the UFC doesn't, technically, you have to sign that contract for that other promoter. Because if you don't, then then it, that contract's thrown out. And if you get another one, again, you have to offer it to them for the right to match. So basically, if you're smart, you just wait 12 months and then start shopping. Well, again, but that's 12 months of your career gone. Yeah, so for a lot of fighters, it's like, do I want to wait that long? Yeah. The, the, the purpose of this for the UFC is, 
the it's a it's basically a it's a last grasp of preventing someone from leaving a valuable asset because they they can if they don't sign you and you leave the UFC makes so much more money than everybody else right if they don't want another promotion to have you because you're valuable they can at least say let's wait to what other people offer them we will match and just bring them back and and that way block any other promotion from ever acquiring these key fighters. Take us into section 14, assumption of the risk waiver of all claims. We are on page 48 for those following around. Go ahead, continue, John. Yes. So look at, okay, do you notice something about the way it's written? Yes, it's all in bold capital letters. The whole thing's in caps. And what it goes through is basically all the risk it's basically saying all the risk is taken on the fighter. You are fully aware and agree that the professional sport of mixed martial arts is inherently an abnormally dangerous activity that can result in severe and permanent physical injury, including but not limited to irreversible neurological trauma, disability, or death. Fighter understands the fighter might suffer injuries to the head. So basically, it just goes on and on. Neck, spine, injury, brain damage, dementia, mood disorder. It goes through every possible thing that could happen to you in a mixed martial arts fight or the post, the, the results of a mixed martial art fight, or what may appear years later, possibly linked to a mixed martial art fight, and say the fighter is, a, is he is participating in his own free will and responsible for any of these damages. The UFC has no, no responsibility whatsoever for this. All right. Now, there is a section beyond that, section 14.2, and there's a little bitty piece of this. Howsoever caused resulting or arising out of or in connection with fighters preparation tell me why you highlighted just that little piece well both of these if you notice this this is language very similar to what we saw when the um when the ufc was starting in the COVID era and you look uh, for any injury, illness, damage, loss, or harm to fighter or fighter's property or fighter's death or disability, however, howsoever caused. Well, the howsoever caused is interesting because basically it's saying, how, what if the fighter's injury is caused by the cage door opening and he falling out? That's not that's not the risk you'd normally associate with you fighting another fighter, right? That's that's a that's a that's a that's a wild card risk that has nothing to do with you deciding to fight another fighter. What if the lights above fall and hit you, right? Yes. That damage or 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 some property damage, similar results of some wild thing damages your property. Um, that you you bring your car to the event and the and the UFC bus crashes into it. All this stuff is basically what they're saying is all these risks and responsibilities is again on the fighter. Though. The UFC is not responsible for that. So uh, re re it releases the parties. Uh, and that also includes the part of the you know, relatives of the fighter, includes the, uh, the trainers, the coaches. Now, a lot of attorneys I've spoken to, stuff like this probably wouldn't stand up, but it's a, it's a somewhat layer of protection for the UFC to put that there and say so that- So this is the spilled bag of ice clause. Ba basically, yes. <laughs> All right. Section 14.3. What's that all about? Uh, well, that one. Uh, oh, sorry. That's basically pretty much the same. Where the other one is uh, it releases the parties. This one in consideration for the opportunity to participate in the vote and with full knowledge and complete assumption of all risks, the releasing parties hereby voluntary release, discharge, waive and relinquish any and all past, future, present claims and causes of action. In other words, all your your lawsuits, all your claims of what the damages are, you you relinquish them. So it, it's tied into the previous one. So basically, this is telling the first one is telling you everything is on you, and this one is telling you because everything is on you, you waive your right to sue. Basically, yes, and it includes it talks about uh, it talks about the results of injury, illness, damage, loss, or harm to the fighter or fighter's property, or the fighter's death or disability. How again, however caused resulting or arising out of any out of out of or in connection with fighters preparation for travel for participation and appearance in any ufc event so it includes the travel includes the getting ready all that stuff for the event that's it's covered all right so we're gonna jump to page 53 section 23 further assurances you have 23.2 highlighted why Okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna note one thing before that. Just right above it on the section two confidentiality, 
Again, it talks about that the fighter shall not disclose to any third party, other than the fighter's agents, professional advisors, any information about the agreement. So again, the, the, the fighters are not allowed to share their contracts with people. Now, what's interesting is Dana White has several times said fighters are free to talk about their contracts, right? We've all heard him say that lately, right? Yes. Again and again, he says, oh, they're free to do anytime. That verbal permission basically should override this contract. Fighters now, if they want to talk about their payment and contracts, this agreement's basically void because Dana White, the representative of the company, has verbally given you permission to talk about it. So it's interesting. It's still here. They're still claiming, you know, fighters probably see that as a chilling effect. They're nervous about violating it. But Dana White's on record several times saying you are free to talk about it. So now to get back to Section 3, further assurances. On this one, fighters should be solely responsible for obtaining all necessary documents. And I, I noted this one specifically because, again, talking about the three fights a year, this one says a fighter, Zupa, that fighters should provide copies of all such documentation to Zupa no less than 30 days prior to any bottle. So if you add up the terms, the fighter has to, uh, the, the fighter yeah, contract lasts a certain amount of fights and months, okay, but doesn't say three fights per year. A fighter, if the, the Zupa doesn't offer them the fights and breaches it, they can get compensated at the end. Well, when did the UFC have to offer them the fights? Really, this dictates is the only only thing in here that has to that has to be complied with the offering the fights. In other words, they have to give a fighter at least thirty days to make sure he can present the documentation to the UFC. And so, instead of saying a fighter has to offer be given three fights a year, they could be given a fight the first year, and then they could be offered a fight, and then six weeks later, uh, another fight. And then another one, and then held off again to the very end of the contract. So there's a lot of flexibility to Zupa. It doesn't all have to be within every three fights every 12 months. They could, they could, they could actually probably give you a fight, wait 18 months, and then, or even two years, and then, and then start offering you all your fights in the last year. Hmm. Man, they really are covering everything under the sun for themselves and leaving very little for the fighters. Very, and I we should know most MMA promotions have very similar contracts. That in boxing, though, again, uh, boxing in part of its it part of the standard contract, thanks to the Ali Act, is there is something called a minimum bouts, and you have to offer fighters, boxers, a minimum number of fights per year. It'll say in the con young boxers, often side the promoter, it'll say something, you've got to offer me six fights a year, seven fights. I can turn them down, but you have to offer me six, seven fights. You might even have to, the contract might say, you might have to offer me two or three opponents, and I can decide which one I want. That would be so ideal for MMA. It really would. But, you know, that's not going to happen anytime this century. What we're going to do now is we're going to close this section down because we have finished going through the contract. We are going to do the next episode covering a bout agreement and a contender series contract. Correct, John? Well, we got a contender series contract. We will talk. We can't share this with this, but we'll probably go over a side letter uh, with some of the details at least. Uh, we will probably look at uh, d details of pay-per-view points from certain contracts. And we also have, uh, there is something else we're going to share, which I can't remember for the life of me. Oh, yes, I know we're going we're gonna to talk about. We also want to share the uh, uh, the UFC, uh, uh, what is it called? It's a, a payment remittance, which is it's, it's just a simple thing, but it describes how the UFC bills the fighters and what's deducted. Oh, this is interesting. Once I interviewed Nate Quarry, well, I've interviewed him several times, but one particular interview, he was very expansive and he covered some things along those lines too. I'm interested to find out how much it's changed in about the roughly nine, 10 years since I did that interview. Well, it might change a lot. Maybe not. Maybe not at all. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? But for now, we're going to wrap this episode. John, tell us what you got going on besides the holidays with the family. Well, I got the holiday with the family. I got, we, we got, uh, I got really nothing. I got, I'm going to be just lounging in Minnesota, freezing. Uh, I don't have any articles coming out. There's no care, don't care. I'm going to be off from if the shoes fit. I'm working, I'll be working hard the next couple of weeks on the book with Jacob Debitz. We've got a book about the history of the UFC's financial history. Uh, should be done next, out sometime next year. 
on top of that. And then I guess if people want, we should note if you we, we're going to do an uh, AMA. Uh, I, we were going to planning to do it, but we did the contracts instead. Uh, but after the holidays, send your questions in. After the holidays, we'll get to that. And you can send your questions to either of us on Twitter, or you can hit up John's email, heynottheface at gmail.com. My Twitter messages are open. And if you would like to email me as well, you can email me, crooklyn949 at gmail.com. So do me a favor. Follow this guy on Twitter at Hey Not the Face because he's freaking awesome. All, he's, only if you're nice. Only if you're nice. And to he's me. always disseminating lots and lots of good information. So pay attention to him. Follow him. And he's also a very funny guy. He's got some really good, good I'm not, one-liners I'm there. Fu- I'm not trying to be funny. That's, you that's are. Uh, news to me. You're a clown, man. What am I, a clown? But Hello. anyways, you're awesome. So follow this guy at Hey Not The Face. And until next time, please stay safe. It's not in the face! Whoa! Thank you.